for enduring, overcoming, helping others, standing in solidarity, and congratulations, the amazing class of 2021. Good morning. As provost, it's my great pleasure to acknowledge the many awards and distinctions accorded our faculty and students this year. Their achievements, many of which are listed in your commencement program, bring honor to them and to the university and deserve our full recognition. I urge your special attention to those members of the faculty who have been honored for their, for their teaching. The eight recipients of the Limbach Teaching Award, the four recipients of the Provost Awards, and those faculty who have been accorded teaching awards from their individual schools. I would also like to recognize the members of the faculty who have stepped down after many years of distinguished service. These dedicated scholars have devoted their careers to the acquisition of knowledge and have shared their wisdom and their insights with students, inspiring them in their own intellectual pursuits. Faculty members who have retired after a lifetime of scholarship and teaching exemplify the high ideals and standards to which all of us in the Academy aspire. Several members of the class of 2021 have distinguished themselves in their academic studies and in their service to the university. I will first name those receiving senior class awards and leadership awards and then acknowledge those receiving academic honors. Please stand when I announce your name and remain standing until I've completed the list. I ask the audience to hold your applause until all the award recipients have been announced. Those receiving senior class honor awards are Anthony Scarpone Lambert, the spoon. Jude Darty, the bowl. Max Joa, the cane. Camilla Duran, the spade. Mercedes Owens, the Althea K. Huddle Shield Award. Elizabeth Ushai, the Gaylor Pete Harmwell Flag Award. Elizabeth Eckert, the David R. Goddard Loving Cup Award. And Mashiah Collins, the R. Jean Brownlee Skimmer Hat Award. The winners of the President's Engagement Prize are Elizabeth Eckerd, Martin Leet, Christina Miranda, Amanda Moreno, Natalia Rahman, Sarah Simon, and Leah Vojtovich. The winners of the President's Innovation Prize are Yuen Lee. Ara Saxena and Anthony Scarpone Lambert. Those seniors receiving leadership awards are Jamie Chung, Asian Alumni Network Student Leadership Award, Uche Nawagulu, Association of Alumni Fathers Trophy. The Association of Alumni Robert J. A. League Senior Award goes to Sydney Bell and Paige Orner. Francis Paulino, Association of Latino Alumni Student Leadership Award. Connor Beard, Association of Native Alumni Student Leadership Award. Jordan King, Black Alumni Society Student Leadership Award. Grace Lee, James Brister Society Student Leadership Award. Lauren Grishow Shade, James Brister Society Graduate Student Leadership Award. Andrew Douglas, Class of 1915 Award. Camilla Duran, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Alumni Association Student Leadership Award. William A. Levy, Kite and Key Society Award for Service and Scholarship goes to Sophia Gonzalez and Rhea Nanja. The winner of the Saul Feinstone Undergraduate Award is Dallas Taylor. The winners of the Penn Alumni Student Award of Merit are Sinea Barguagar, Sophia Gonzalez, Daniel Gordon, Andrew Lamb, Jennifer Richards, and Emily Solomon. The Trustees Council of Penn Women Michelle Huber and Brian D. Giles Award goes to Jason Sean. The Trustees Council of Penn Women Student Leadership Award, Sakshi Sagal. The James Howard Weiss Memorial Award goes to Karen Herrera. Please join me in applauding these talented young people. You may sit down. Now, I would like to acknowledge those who have been elected to the Principal, Undergraduate, and Graduate Honor Societies. Please stand as I name each society. Phi Beta Kappa, Matthew Cryer Honor Society, 
Omicron Kappa Upsilon, Eta Kappa Nu, Tau Beta Pi, Omega Alpha Omega Alpha, Gold Humanism Honor Society, Sigma Theta Tau, Phi Zeta, and Beta Gamma Sigma. Will all students who are the recipients of various prizes and awards granted by their schools and departments, and those who by their academic accomplishments have earned scholarships for advanced study, please rise as well. I ask the, join, the audience to join me in saluting these outstanding young people. You may be seated. Congratulations. Good morning, President Gutman, Provost Pritchett, trustees, honorary degree recipients, faculty colleagues, families, friends, and most of all, congratulations, class of 2021. <laughs> the first statue of Benjamin Franklin to appear on the Penn campus was commissioned by the class of 1904. It's located in front of Waitman Hall at what was then the center of the campus. It depicts a young Franklin with his walking stick and satchel as he would have appeared on his way to Philadelphia in 1723 when he was 17. He took a ship from Boston to New York, and when he couldn't find work in New York, he walked to Philadelphia, where he eventually found a job as a printer. He soon sailed for London to obtain materials to start his own print shop, absorbing its metropolitan lessons for a couple of years, but then returned to Philadelphia. I could point out that Franklin walked through Princeton on the way, but did not stop to start a university there. But I cite this statue to make a different point. Franklin's statue opens a window into an earlier and strikingly different world, when climate change was still in the future. Let me say it simply. Franklin walked from New York to Philadelphia to look for work. The New Jersey that he walked across was all field and forest, with a climate that had been stable since the last ice age. The London in which Franklin landed was probably the largest metropolis ever powered by wood, wind, and water. But within a century, uh, its explosive growth would be fueled by coal. 18th century London offers us a valuable point of comparison for the transition to new renewable resources that we now face, and illustrates how many times the world has changed uh, radically in the short life of this country. My grandmother was born in a world without cars, refrigerators, or radios, uh, and at the end was flying to London to visit friends, just as I was born in a world without the internet or responsive electronics, while you interact digitally with complex friend groups beyond my experience. The invention of a low-carbon economy is not just a technical project, but a social, political, and economic one in which we all have to invent new ways of living and working together. My point is that this country has been adapting to radical change since Franklin walked across New Jersey. So we look to your generation to imagine and build the low-carbon world that must come next. Franklin's statue also reminds us of the grit and persistence needed for success. This is the story Franklin told in his autobiography, and it's a lesson you've already absorbed or you wouldn't be here. Among all of Franklin's many written words, the class of 1904 chose for these for the base of the statue, and I quote, I have been the more particular in this description of my journey that you may compare such unlikely beginnings with the figure I have since made there. Franklin was justifiably proud of his accomplishments, but I think there is a more subtle point we can read in his comment, which is that many accomplished people are never fully convinced of their success. I offer that as further encouragement to persist as you find your own path and as a caution to be considerate of those with whom you are competing. Through his long career, Franklin came to personify thrift, and I can think of no better virtue to recommend in the face of global climate change. As the latest book on Franklin argues, thrift means working productively, consuming wisely, saving proportionately, and giving generously. Thank you. The honorary degrees will now be conferred. It's a pen tradition that dates back to the 1750s. The full text of each citation is included in the commencement program and online. Elizabeth Alexander, 
With poetry as your torch, you bring light to our world. With your leadership, you strengthen the arts and open creative doors for more people everywhere. Penn proudly claims you as a sister of our alumni community. In fact, you published your first critically acclaimed work as a student here. President-elect Obama asked you to deliver poetry for his inauguration. With praise song for the day, you captured history and you cast all our eyes to the future. In recognition of your powerful creative voice, the trustees of the University of Pennsylvania are pleased and honored to confer upon you, Elizabeth a Alexander, the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa. <clears throat> Francis H. Arnold, you pioneered better ways to unlock, unlock the power of essential enzymes. Life-saving developments followed, winning you the Nobel Prize in chemistry. You were the first American woman to have the honor. You are a faculty member at the Caltech California Institute of Technology. With more than 60 U.S. patents, you have also found, founded multiple biotech companies. President Obama awarded you the National Medal of Technology and Innovation. President Biden named you to lead the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, PCAST. For your discoveries and service to all, the trustees of the University of Pennsylvania are honored and pleased to confer upon you, Francis H. Arnold, the degree of Doctor of Sciences, honoris causa. <clears throat> David L. Cohn, a common thread runs through your life your extraordinary determination to serve your community. What a maven you are. As a proud Penn Law alumnus, as chair of one of the country's largest law firms, and as the legendary chief of staff to Philly Mayor Ed Rendell. At Comcast Corporation, you served at the highest levels and you continue to provide invaluable counsel. You lowered barriers to vital tech and you connected young people to viable skills. Innumerable local and national boards benefit from your expertise. Your honors are legion, and the names of the people you have touched or mentored would fill volumes. Few have had as profound a positive impact on our beloved city and region. We celebrate you most of all for your indelible impact as Penn trustee, especially as chair of the board. You have helped Penn set the bar for its peers. Engaging with students and faculty brings you the greatest joy. Your alma mater will for forever treasure your visionary leadership, and your city will forever celebrate your passionate devotion. The trustees of the University of Pennsylvania are honored and pleased to confer upon you, David L. Cohn, the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa. <laughs> Joy Harjo. You were the first Native American to be named U.S. Poet Laureate. You said simply, you never know where you're going to land. We see courage throughout your journey. You published your first volume of poetry while still a student. Your poetry will be included on a plaque on Lucy, a NASA spacecraft launching this fall. Your memoir, Crazy Brave, won the American Book Award. You also perform as a vocalist and a saxophonist. Your albums include this year's I Pray for My Enemies and Winding Through the Milky Way. Across these mediums, your work bears witness to the present and the past, underscored with First Nations storytelling. In recognition of your courageous sharing of the truth, 
the trustees of the University of Pennsylvania are honored and pleased to confer upon you, Joy Harjo, the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa. David Miliband. The first refugees I met were my parents. This truth underscores your life's work. Through your leadership, you help millions of families in urgent need around the world. You were only 29 when you advised Prime Minister Tony Blair, followed by roles in Parliament and beyond. You have driven progress on critical issues from emissions to human rights. Fortune magazine named you one of the world's greatest leaders. Organizations far and wide seek your expertise, and you authored the book Rescue, Refugees and the Political Crisis of Our Time. For your advocacy, for the most vulnerable, the trustees of the University of Pennsylvania are pleased and honored to confer upon you, David Miliband, the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa. Lorene Powell Jobs. You preach the gospel of transformative change, from education to immigration, from climate to cancer research. You inspire others to action. Penn claims you proudly. You earned your degrees in the college and in Wharton. Let's hear it for the college in Wharton. Nursing and engineering, too. We'll get it all, right? Yes. Your engagement continues with the National Advisory Board for the Netter Center. You founded College Track to combat the achievement gap facing students of color. You also founded the nation's leading organization dedicated to rethinking the high school experience. For your passionate determination, to cultivate new opportunities for those most in need, the trustees of the University of Pennsylvania are honored and pleased to confer upon you, Lorene Powell Jobs, the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa. John Williams. You are called a living legend, a living history of the American movie soundtrack, and how true. Just consider a taste of your credits. To Kill a Mockingbird and Jaws, Schindler's List and Jurassic Park, E.T., Indiana Jones and Saving Private Ryan, nine Star Wars films and three Harry Potter films. <laughs> You have five Academy Awards and more nominations than any other living person. You have seven British Academy Awards, four Golden Globes, five Emmys, and 25 Grammys. The Library of Congress has even honored the Star Wars soundtrack with preservation in perpetuity. For the truly great music of our times, the trustees of the University of Pennsylvania are honored and pleased to confer upon you, John Williams, the degree of Doctor of Music, honoris causa. <laughs> Janet L. Yellen. You are the first woman U.S. Secretary of the Treasury. As Dessa put it in the song, who's yelling now? Watch your step, there's broken glass. Janet broke another ceiling, you can bet your brass. Yours is a career of firsts. You are the first to lead the federal government's three most powerful economic bodies, the Treasury, the White House Council of Economic Advisors, and the first woman to chair the Federal Reserve. 
a distinguished fellow of the American Economic Association. You're also a founding member of the Climate Leadership Council. For your incomparable service to your country, the trustees of the University of Pennsylvania are honored and pleased to confer upon you Janet L. Yellen, the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa. Let's hear it for all our honorary degree recipients. As provost, it's my honor to introduce our speaker this morning. Graduates, that's all of you. In this year of uncertainty, here's what I know. You made it. You made it. The pandemic dealt us this unusual year, but we hope, we know, we hope, it won't be repeated. But there's been much more to this past year than just the pandemic. We've been shocked not just by the extraordinary, but in fact by what's become shockingly ordinary in our society. In his second essay on nature, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote that the difference between the wise and the unwise is this. The latter wonders at what is unusual. The wise man wonders at the usual. Lorene Powell Jobs chose Emerson as the namesake of her organization, the Emerson Collective. With her strong guidance and financial support, the collective strives to build a more just, more equal America. An America that questions and confronts systemic unfairness that has been normalized. A place that's come to expect business as usual. Unequal economic, educational, and health outcomes. Restrictive voting measures and runaway climate change. Ms. Powell Jobs and the Emerson Collective would, I think, urge us to think different to reimagine our society and rebuild our nation based on principles of equality, equal justice, and equal opportunity, and equal outcomes. Through partnerships and strategic investments in education, environmental and racial justice, journalism, cancer research, and immigration, the collective intends to give $28 billion, an amount that Ms. Powell Jobs has noted represents her entire fortune. Not surprisingly, nor unusual, to see such outsized generosity and social responsibility from a fellow Quaker. I expect that you too will lead by example, wondering at what is and imagining what could be. Graduates, please join me in welcoming Lorene Powell Jobs. Thank you, Provost Pritchett. And thank you, President Gutman and Board Chair Cohen, for your outstanding stewardship of this American treasure during these unprecedented days. Hello, Class of 2021. Hello. Hello, graduates from around the world, from China, Switzerland, Kenya, and my own home country, the nation state of New Jersey. <laughs> I, am, I am deeply honored and grateful to be with you today. I'm here because of the education I received from this university. Graduating from Penn is a real accomplishment. I rejoice with you that your efforts have brought you to this day. And congratulations to all the parents, families, and friends who coaxed you along, picked you up, and supported you every step of the way. As the mom of a college senior at another university, I celebrate with your parents, too. You are no ordinary class of college graduates. History has seen to that. You faced more than the commonplace challenges of a rigorous education. You pursued your studies during a global pandemic, and many of you participated in our historic and long overdue reckoning with racial injustice. The way you've adapted and triumphed this past year is truly impressive. And I congratulate you on something even more impressive. As you adapted, you kept your sense of joy and your readiness for adventure. 
When I graduated from Penn back in 1985, I remember feeling nervous about what my future held. And though the world you're graduating into feels in so many ways more precarious, my uncertainties and anxieties were real. Growing up, I was raised in a middle-class town and spent summers on the Jersey Shore and listening to Bruce Springsteen. My mother had been a high school history teacher, and we lost my father when I was three. My father was a pilot in the Marines, and he died in a mid-air collision while training other pilots. It was a shocking, scarring loss. My mother, who was only 30 years old, had four children under the age of six. Yet she found grace amid the suffering, modeling resilience that we all internalized as our own. To attend Penn, I needed some creative financing. So I took out multiple student loans. I had scholarships of all sizes, like anyone else. But that wasn't enough, so I waitressed at Smokey Joe's on the weekends. Yes. Yes, I did. But most importantly, I held a work-study job as the receptionist at Penn Student Agencies. And as I was working there during my freshman year, I had an idea for a new agency. The director took a risk on me, and I started parent services, creating care packages and birthday cakes and delivering them to students. One night, we delivered a surprise care package to the university president, thinking he would be a good influencer for our sales. We unintentionally triggered his silent alarm, and the next morning we were visited by university police, who told us the cake was eaten by the president's guard dog. And while I have no doubt that the dog enjoyed the cake, this was not a good influencer for our sales. So while that idea was a failure, I caught the entrepreneurship bug at Penn and have had it ever since. And not to worry, the dog was fine. I share this with you to say I may not know what it's like to graduate during a pandemic or to enter a job market like this one, but I do know what it's like to feel both excitement and trepidation about what lies on the other side of a college degree. I know that in times like these, times of hardship and uncertainty, it can feel like the world is conspiring to shrink our sense of possibility to sour us to the daring adventure of life. I'm here to say, don't let it. I suspect many of you are feeling concerned because you don't know exactly what you want to do for the rest of your lives. Well, I didn't either. I did know that I wanted a life that included service. I interviewed with the Peace Corps, but my financial reality wouldn't allow that path. So instead, I ended up on the fixed income trading floor at Goldman Sachs. <laughs> yeah. No, it, 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 I know, I know, it wasn't the Peace Corps, but I did learn survival skills. And I also I did something very important to me. I supported myself in New York City, and after a few years, paid off all my student loans. So thank you, Goldman. My experience at Goldman gave me something even more valuable. When I told my boss I was leaving, he assured me that there would always be a position at the company if I ever returned. And in saying that, he gave me, for the first time in my life, a safety net to fall back on. It was more than a promise of financial security, although that was wonderful relief. But with this safety net, I had permission to imagine the world not as dangerous but as wondrous, to dream up different life paths. And from that moment on, I thought differently about what was possible to accomplish, what was possible to see, how I could possibly be helpful to others along my path. I wish that same appetite for adventure, that same readiness for surprise and delight for every one of you. 
your sense of possibility will always be a great spiritual resource. Take good care of it. Teach it to others. For we are only as large as our horizons. We go to college to widen them. But the task of widening is the work of a lifetime. For me, I began to imagine how I could be useful to others. I felt myself changing. Change in ourselves and change in the world happens similarly. It comes slowly, slowly, and then all at once. What matters is your readiness for the moment of revelation, of challenge, of opportunity. We have to be prepared to walk through the door when it opens, or by our own power and purpose to open it ourselves. And sometimes we need to tear down walls, the ones within and the ones without. We learned this at the end of the Cold War. Standing at the Berlin Wall, a symbol of oppression that was built to prevent people from escaping Soviet-controlled East Berlin into West Berlin, President Reagan challenged Russia's Gorbachev to tear down this wall. And then something even more startling happened. The wall was getting torn down. It was a turning point in world history, one of the defining moments of the 20th century. My best friend and I were determined to witness history and go see that wall come down. We watched on television as German citizens were taking sledgehammers to this edifice, but we had no money for the journey. I was back in graduate school and back in debt. So we sold shares in our trip to old colleagues, promising in return to bring them a piece of the Berlin Wall. That wall was made of concrete, rebar, and old ideas. And then just like that, people reconnected and a new world was born. When I finished graduate school, I followed my dream of becoming an entrepreneur. I started an organic vegetarian food company called Terra Vera. This was a rather radical idea 30 years ago. It was aligned with my passion to make healthy, delicious food more convenient and more ubiquitous. Within a few years, we were supplying Northern California's Whole Foods and Safeways with fresh prepared food every day and running a fleet of food trucks that we affectionately called Earth Cruisers. Life was full. I had two young children. My husband was working long days and I was running this startup. And right about that time, a local high school teacher invited me to speak to her first-generation college-bound students. I agreed, not knowing my life was about to change. It was the fall of the student senior year. I was so impressed with these students. They had everything it takes to succeed in college. Grit, tenacity, talent, and a will to persevere. In fact, they spoke about their college ambitions with excitement and joy. But it soon became clear that none of them had taken or planned to take the SATs. No one had told them that they needed to. Most had never visited a college campus. And worse yet, only three of the 35 students in the class had taken the classes they needed to even apply to a four-year college. When I left the class, I couldn't stop thinking about the students. Public education, I believe, is central to the promise of America. It was designed to be our great equalizer. My own education, as I stated, changed my life and my opportunities. And yet, through the randomness of where they were born, these students' possibilities were narrowed for them. That day at Carlmont High School, well over 20 years ago, laid bare a disturbing truth in our country, that while talent is equally distribu it distributed, opportunity is not. At some point in all of our lives, we must ask ourselves, what happens when you confront an unacceptable reality? Do you act or do you look away? I chose the former. I returned to the class every Friday that fall and served as their unofficial college advisor. 
Soon after that, I stepped back from Terra Vera. It was a big life decision for me. I had wanted to start a company since I was here at Penn. It was why I went to graduate school. But when life opens a door, as it will for all of you, we must be prepared to walk through it. It was from that experience that College Track was born. We began with 25 ninth graders, knowing that if we changed just one of their lives, the whole effort would have been worth it. And today, we're serving thousands of students in more than a dozen centers across our country, accompanying them, supporting them on their journeys through high school and college. There is no higher or better use of your time on this planet than to be helpful to others. I learned this at College Track. All the systems in our society were created by people no smarter and no more capable than any of you. And through your energy and intention and force of will, you can change them. But only if you understand them. Identifying systemic breakdowns and then imagining new structures is why I started Emerson Collective. I wanted to do more to address the multiple interlocking injustices that were evident from working with parents, students, and families. At Emerson, we work in the realm of ideas, design, and action. We know that system redesign often requires policy redesign, and we work on that as well. But overriding everything is a recognition that humanity is bound together and we realize our own potential only by caring for each other. Think about your own relationships here at Penn. Who you cared for. Who cared for you. All of life is reciprocity, filled with the circular joy in giving and grace in receiving. It's important to partner your joy with humility. Even as we use our heads, we must learn to bow them. Humility and ambition need not contradict each other. We should all be ambitious to be good stewards of our planet and good caretakers of one another during the brief time we have together. Because sometimes our time here is briefer than we desire. We lost my husband Steve almost 10 years ago. My children and I grieved along with people across the world. And I'd like to share what I learned about loss through that experience. We do not pass through grief and leave it behind. Instead, I found, we integrate it. Along with the joyful memories, all the laughter, all the love, into who we are. One of life's most beautiful dimensions is integrating those you've loved and lost into your own being. We see more, and we understand more, and we love more. Steve used to say, your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Let his words guide you as they've guided me. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. And while you're doing it, love who you do it for and love who you are while you do it. As long ago as Socrates, we've been praising the examined life. But the examination of a life is not an idea. It's a daily practice. Discover or create your own practices. They don't have to be grandiose, but they must be regular. Make space for them and make time. Tend to your soul and to your community. Infuse your values into every part of what you do and how you live. Your values should be like your fingerprints, proof of where you have been and what you have touched. 
Well, a few months ago, I had the opportunity to speak with several members of your graduating class. Truly extraordinary students with deep commitment to the world outside of their academic pursuits. With them and all of you in mind, Emerson Collective is making a gift to the education nonprofit Donors Choose, a gift that will help teachers prepare their own students for college. So in honor of each of you 3,000 graduates, we will support 3,000 classrooms. <laughs> graduates. You will all have opportunities to serve throughout your lives. Don't let them pass by. Align your talents, your spirit, and your energy to make this world more equal and more just. I assure you, the attempt itself will fill your soul. It is its own reward. I cannot wait to see everything you accomplish, the changes you bring, the healing you bring, the better, more humane world that you and your generation create. What an honor it is to be with you and be part of your graduating class. Congratulations, class of 2021. Thank you, Ms. Powell Jobs, for those inspirational words and for your leadership. Degrees will now be conferred. Oh, come on.